them down, we put them in this big ring that you are standing on, big not by LHC standards, but relatively big, and they go round and round and round and round and they get slowed down. We can explain how that happens, but we don't need to today. Um, they get slowed down. When they come out of that ring, how slow or how fast are they? Because... Good, good. Okay, good. Now, okay, so when they come out of the, of the AD, they still have about 10% uh, of the velocity of light. 10% of the velocity of light. Of the velocity velocity of, of light is 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. That's 10% of that is pretty fast. It's pretty I fast. Don't... So that's why, that, that's why then they get put into this thing called Eleanor. Is that, that correct? Yes, exactly. This is and the when they come out of Eleanor, how fast are they when they come out of Eleanor? They are pretty, still pretty fast. But... We would not manage to, to overtake them. They have one, one and a half percent of the velocity of light, roughly. Okay, one and a half percent of the velocity of light. I'll let, calcul uh, I'll let Harrison do the calculation there. The so they, so they, they're still going pretty fast. And yes. what you want to do is you want to grab them, somehow yes. grab them, store them, and then throw in some anti-electrons. Well, so first question is how do you how do you stop the antiprotons and the second question is where do you get the anti-electrons from because we haven't talked about anti-electrons at all yet where do they come now, from okay now we discuss we go to the very other end of the uh, of, of the chain i mean this, this is done by the by the experiments and of course before the experiment can uh, capture these antiprotons in the traps they have to further decelerate them now, there are different techniques uh, to, to further decelerate them on their side. Uh, the most standard one is to send these uh, antiprotons uh, to a thin foil. And that had already been done like that with the AD. And this will also be uh, made by many of the experiments uh, with Elena. The send is them, sorry, send, send them to a what point? To a thin foil, so to, to a little bit of uh, two meta. If, if the discharge particles transverse matter, they are slowed down because they interact with the electron. Okay. Yeah, if the, if the energy is higher, the initial energy, then one needs a thicker foil than if the energy is uh, lower. And what okay, has so. Because of the AD, when the experiment received the beam done from the AD, they needed to, to use a relatively thick foil and even. With an optimized thickness, many of the antiprotons uh, were stopped inside the foil, or roughly the other half had too high in energy in order to be trapped. So they could use only less than 1% of the antiprotons uh, sent to them uh, from the AD. Okay, I had a little bit of difficulty hearing what you were saying there, but I think what you're saying is that you pass the, the antiprotons through thin foils, which slow them down. Is that correct? Uh, no, uh, not really well understanding. No. I will, first, I will take off the mask. I think it will be easier to understand. Yeah, yeah good. <laughs> I'm anyhow more or less alone in the, the boy now. Yeah, yeah it's okay. always difficult taking off the mask. Yeah. See whether it works better. Um, yeah, they, they have the, the antiprotons, uh, they traverse the thin foil just in front of the experiment, and this uh, slows, slows them down. Okay. And uh, how do, but, but they're still moving. So, how do you actually, is there a bottle that you can keep them in there? Well, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a pet, so called tanning trap. Uh, it is made of, uh, out of electric. Electric potential, electric fields, uh, and uh, magnetic fields. And in fact, what the antiprotons can do once this uh, kind of bottle is closed, uh, they are just traveling forth and back in one certain direction. Uh, okay. So, they, yeah. yeah transverse yes. Confined so you have, by the so you travel, you travel, you, you collect them in, in this let's say uh, potential well, let's say, and they just bounce backwards and forwards and they don't touch anything. It's really important that they don't 
touch anything because if they touch something, you've exactly. lost them. You've exactly. lost them. So you have to create this complex uh, magnetic and electric fields which are able to grab. Now, uh, uh, I always remember that it was in about 1996 or something like this that the first antiproton atoms were made and they couldn't grab them in those days and so they immediately annihilated okay so this is a but today how many can you actually keep in your electric magnetic bottle how, how many are we talking about in terms of antiprotons yeah so what uh, the amount of antiprotons we send them in one shot is order of magnitude of a million a few hundred thousand and uh, with Elena experiments expect that they can uh, capture most of them. So in one shot, they get a few hundred thousand uh, antiproton traps in their, in their trap. And how long can you keep them? Very, for very long duration. So there is one experiment, uh, which is a little bit space, uh, and they, uh, can, they make um, experiments with single antiproton. They have a reservoir trap, and they kept antiprotons for more than a year in this trap. More than? One year. One year? Yes. But wow. This is really a, this is, does that, yeah, okay. does, does that mean you could, does that mean you could collect a million antiprotons, put them in this bottle and put it in your rucksack and, uh, go off to the other side of the site or uh, maybe uh, get on a plane and, and take them to Florida? Is that is that feasible? It's not that simple. These traps are complex objects, uh, which need superconducting magnets to create the magnetic field, uh, which means uh, very high uh, electric potentials uh, and so on. Uh, so it's not so easy to, to carry such traps in a backpack. But, uh, okay. There are now three projects uh, uh, underway aiming at uh, constructing portable traps. Portable and, uh, traps, wow. Yes. One, at least one of this... those is expected to come into the hole next year in order to clean the traps. So okay, but we haven't yet made anti-hydrogen. We've only, we've only captured the anti-protons. Um, um, yes. The aim was actually, one of the aims is to actually to produce anti-hydrogen. How does that? How does that happen? Yeah. Then for that, one has to to, to fill the trap uh, in addition to the antiprotons with uh, the positrons or uh, anti-electrons, the antiparticles to the to the electrons. And where do we get those from? Well, there again, there are there are different methods to create these anti-protons. So most of the experiments they use uh, radioactive uh, sources. From which, from time to time, uh, such a positron uh, comes out. And then those those uh, positrons they have to be accumulated and cooled until they can be injected into into the trap. Okay, so let's say we can do that. So <clears throat> we can get we can get anti anti electrons from a sodium something, a, 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 a source that gives off that gives off electron anti electrons. So then we put them together with the antiprotons, and wow, if we're lucky, one of the antiprotons will capture an anti-electron and make anti-hydrogen. Wow, this is, this is crazy. But then you have an immediate problem. You have a huge problem. Does anybody know what the problem might be? You have a huge problem then. Anti-hydrogen is actually neutral and all the tricks that uh, these guys have been playing so far all depend on the particles having a charge and as soon as they become neutral they can wander wherever they want so, Mickey, so you have a problem Mickey. yes let me let me ask a question um, what do you think would what do you think happens uh, when matter and antimatter touch each other? Anyone? Does it explode? Isn't there? That's right. That's right. It, it, you, you produce basically energy. And so if you have an anti hydrogen atom, uh, you like to keep it away from 
uh, a hydrogen atom for, for good reason. Uh, Mick? Yes. Oh, do you hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, can we can we uh, get because uh, Christian and then uh, Stolkart is also waiting to explain to give some details of the of the instruments. We can have uh, when once we get out of the slide here, we can have um, more detailed discussions. But I, I'd like to get them uh, liberated again. So maybe Christian Christian can uh, because he's project leader of, of what you see behind me here. Uh, maybe he should give us some inside information on his project accelerator and later i can I, i'd like to in, uh, introduce you to Volkat, who's waiting there who is uh, okay. a member of the asakusa uh, experiment who is actually uh, one of the uh, antimatter traps so christian please can you please uh, give us some inside information on this amazing piece of the uh, development of, of the technology you know here yeah okay so then I will speak just, just a little bit uh, about the machines, about the AD, and about uh, Emina, and then we'll hand over to, to, to others to explain more in detail what the experiment do with it. So we said already, uh, once the antiprotons are produced, they are captured in uh, the antiproton decelerator, uh, and there they have to be uh, decelerated uh, to the lowest energy which one can reach under good conditions in this long machine. Not, so the this. lower energy the more it becomes it's not a strong limit uh, for the lowest energy one can do effective limit and as we said before in the past experiments received the antiproton no, yeah. uh, <laughs> most of these antiprotons were lost only less than a percent for the deal so the motivation of this project of the dream you can see here of Elena was to further decelerate the antiprotons in a controlled way, in a better, more controlled way than just send them to, to a piece of matter where they scatter and, and so on. And so what you can see here is this Elena ring, and in fact it, it's, uh, well, it's a small synchrotron. Uh, working principles are very similar to, to, the, to the LHV. It's made out of magnets, uh, bending magnets, focusing magnets, uh, and so on. But of course what's very different is uh, the size, the energy range, and then uh, the technology used. So here there are no superconducting magnets, uh, uh, conventional magnets uh, and, and the small machine. Okay, so what you can see here then, yeah, uh, in the corner, you see six bending magnets. They are the, the main purpose is just uh, to, to deflect the beam and to, to keep the beam on, uh, on a closed trajectory. For the intention, uh, okay, then um, uh, imagine uh, that uh, so different particles, they are not uh, traveling exactly at the center of the vacuum chamber, parallel to the, to the center of the vacuum chamber. There are different positions and angles. So it's like the rays of a torch. Uh, and uh, if one wouldn't do anything, then the scene would just become larger and larger, like, like the cone of the torch, and all particles would be lost in the vacuum chamber. So that's what needs. Uh, that's why we need some focusing. And uh, for that, we need a new very special magnet, which are called quadrupoles. And that's uh, this orange uh, object you can see in, inside the space section. Then, of course, there are plenty of, uh, of, of, of other uh, equipment uh, which, is, which is needed as well. Now, with the help of such a magnetic structure, one can keep the beam for more or less long duration in the ring, but we could not change the energy just to this uh, uh, next. For that one needs the so-called diaspora resistor. And that's, in our case, is a very, very small object. Uh, I don't know whether I see these. Uh, yeah. um, it's, a bit, it's the middle of the, in the center of, of the screen now, this small metallic object, which is centrally uh, to the left and to the right. I don't know whether it's, this, is, this is the IF cavity. Uh, and that, that provides an IF voltage, which is uh, by much more than, than we would need. Okay, and if the beam is accelerated or decelerated, or if it's protons or antiprotons, for us, uh, accelerated, uh, it does not really change much. So to decelerate the beam, we just have to lower the magnetic field, and in parallel, they'll synchronize with that change the rate of uh, the frequency of the IF system. And then, in our case, the beam is accelerated. 
Okay, then the very important ingredient uh, for this uh, machine is the electron cooler. And this is this object uh, you can see here now in the, in the center of the screen. And in fact, when, what one does there is one mixes an electron beam as if it's a circulating uh, anti proton beam. And that, uh, uh, in our carbon, uh, cools the beam. Uh, what probably more easy to understand is the mechanism that uh, it reduces the transverse uh, dimensions of the beam. And it also uh, reduces the energy dispersion uh, of the beam. So it's before, um, uh, before cooling, uh, particles have uh, somewhat different energy, and this uh, bit of this energy distribution is uh, introduced uh, due to, thanks to the selective cooling. That's very important, first of all, in order to reduce uh, or mitigate losses to deceleration. So we don't decelerate in one go, but uh, decelerate when the media is energy. That it will be cooled, and then it's further decelerated to the, to the final energy. And then also the final energy, the beam is cooled in order to make the generator small dense uh, branches, uh, which are then more useful for the experiments than in large branches with the high energy uh, features. Okay. And uh, the challenge, challenges of this project uh, uh, it is, it are, for example, uh, magnetic field quality. So we have to be very careful with the construction of these magnets uh, to make sure that uh, with the uh, low field values which, uh, which we reach uh, at the lowest energy, the field is still good enough such that the beam can circulate well on stable trajectory. Another challenge is, uh, is the vacuum system. So at these low energies, uh, um, particles tend to interact with the scattered easily uh, when they uh, leave the uh, rest of molecules in the vacuum chamber. So what, what can happen very easily is that uh, an electron uh, interacts uh, and counters uh, the rest of molecules, but enters a little bit the electron cloud and is uh, uh, deflected. And deflected that strongly that it's lost on the vacuum chamber. So in order to, to uh, reduce these losses, we need uh, quite, uh, quite a good, uh, quite a low rest of pressure. That's achieved. Uh, by a so called base out. That's why you, you can see this, uh, uh, this silvery surface is all over the place, uh, to look, which looks a little bit like aluminum foil. That's in fact uh, a combination between uh, heating elements uh, just on the vacuum chamber and then thermal insulation around. So, what happens there is that before the machine is put in operation, uh, pumps are switched on and then uh, such a base out is, uh, is started. The idea is that molecules which may sit on the surface of the, of the vacuum chamber, they are released with higher probability with a higher temperature and are pumped out. So during that process, the, the surface just becomes, becomes cleaner. So the number of molecules sitting on the surface is reduced. And in reality, the, the process is a little bit more complicated. There are also some surfaces which do act as pumps. They have to, have to be activated uh, and so on. Uh, in terms of this, uh, once the, the vacuum chamber is uh, room temperature again. Uh, the, the pressure inside the system is uh, lower than it was before. And low enough uh, in order to have a sufficient lifetime to operate this, uh, that machine. Uh, okay. okay, good. So now you see the ring. Uh, what, you, what, what I would like to show you now is the extraction line. So you can see here underneath an extraction line. Uh, which goes here in this direction into an experimental area. And what's special with the uh, transfer lines is that it's not made out of magnets, but it's made out of uh, electrostatic elements, which is a very effective solution, a cost effective uh, and efficient solution at these lower energy. So, uh, an electrostatic quadrupole, uh, which just consists out of uh, electrodes uh, inside the inside, uh, Bigger vacuum tank uh, doesn't cost a lot uh, and it's very efficient to focus the beam. That allows us uh, to install many of these quadrupoles along the line, which is uh, much better to, to, to bring the beam a controlled way to the, to the experiment. Okay, something I would like to show you here. Uh, what you can see here is uh, a transfer line from the AD to Elena. So this transfer line is not a stretch line, it's an injection line. It, it's made out of magnets. That's why you can see these two, these two puzzle points. Okay. And then the thing is injected this region into the ring. 
uh, very important for us for operation or to, to, to put this machine in operation with, uh, with an iron sword, which, uh, which you made here in the corner. And in fact, the idea is that uh, uh, the lowest energy uh, we want to, to reach 100 kV uh, can be reached uh, by a relatively simple iron sword, just without the radio frequency structure. Uh, just the simple iron source without very costly uh, installation. And this uh, iron source generates H minus ions. In fact, that proton, the two electrons are attached to them. And that for us looks very, very similar to an antiproton. It has the same charge because it's just one negative charge. But, uh, and then it's a uh, tiny little bit uh, heavier than, uh, than an antiproton because it, it, it has the mass also of the two electrons which are attached. But for us, it's almost identical to an antiproton. And that allows us to do many tests uh, of the rain and then also of the extraction line. So during the last weeks and months, uh, we have done many tests uh, of the ring and also uh, commissioned the transfer line system to H minus five, which was very, very successful and very important for the project. It means that when later this year, in summer, antiprotons will become available again. It will be very fast uh, uh, to, to start up the Lena and bring it into the experiment. Yes. Okay. Now, uh, do you have questions concerning the accelerator part? Hello, can you hear me? Okay, so then I hand over to Polka, who will explain you about the experiment. Hello. By the, way, by, the way, by, by the way, he's walking on top of the antiproton decelerator there. He's walking on a, a concrete box and underneath his feet, we have the AD. I'm wondering whether we'll be able to go inside and have a look actually later, but let's leave it for now. Yeah. So okay. I will now walk along the AD and have a look whether we can get inside the concrete here of this house, the AD. The reason why the AD is housed in my concrete field is because once we have the anti on starting inside the AD, I see. We have a problem that start clicking. This goes on for a while. Yes. They're usually uh, one and a half, two hours long. And Good luck with your talk today. This can be um, quite dangerous. In order to protect us from this radiation, we use concrete blocks which are thick enough to, you know, to absorb all the surveys. So that's the reason why the ring is hidden from us. So this ring, as you can see, goes to the whole hall. And I'm approaching now a stairway where I will walk down and then have a look whether we can get inside this concrete here. Right now, we don't have any visa. We have a long shutdown, which is used to external to repair all kinds of electronic updates, the ring and so on, which has advantage for us that there's no radiation and we should be able to enter the ring. You mean you're going to take us inside a particle accelerator? Wow. A decelerator. It's basically like an accelerator, just the other way around. Well, this yeah. door is unfortunately new and locked, though. <laughs> and yeah, it's. As you can see, we have like a safety interlock, which looks quite scary, but the idea is just to make sure that nobody is inside once the team inside gets started. I read, so, the book, uh, I read the book, Angels and Demons, and uh, yeah. Dan, Dan Brown said in his book that you, uh, the only way you could get into the uh, anti-proton uh, hall was to steal the eye of a physicist to get in. Is that correct? No, you can just apply for access. I mean, there's <laughs> not, no secrets inside. This is 
merely uh, to protect ourselves from dangerous radiation, which is yeah, once that's... you give the valid reason, for example, hey, I like to get the visitors in and it is safe, yeah, then there's no reason not to let us in. But mm. right now, there seems to be either some repair or something ongoing where the beam a public access to be kind of dangerous. I mean, yeah, yeah, like in a working environment, and someone has to make sure that all the safety standards are put in place. That's but it is, but it is, it is true that if you do have authorization to go in, you do have to show your eye to a reader. Yes, for the and if, it, if, it, if it doesn't rec if it doesn't yeah. recognize your iris. Uh, you don't get in. So yeah, this is, this is true. Dan there Brown is, was uh, true. Iris yeah. yeah. I mean, if you're not, uh, well, you still can go in. You stuff just with someone who can guide you in. This again is just for the fact that once the machine is running, I mean, the radiation is so powerful that it can kill you very quickly, so you won't have enough time to leave. So the idea. Hear me? Yes. Okay, can you still hear me? Yes. Okay, there seems to be a uh, kind of like, okay, that's right. Well, to answer this question, yes, there is an RS scanner. The idea is just so we know who's inside the ring in case of extent sentence. Because the ring is underground and so it's important to know what's going on because it is limited but it's very easy to get in is it safe i mean there are visitors you can come once covid is over and then you can guide you down to the experiments so you don't need to steal an area of system to get into the ring so right now where we are it's like you went into one of the experimental areas where we do this on, uh, perform experiments with the antiprotons. There are like a total of five experiments which are located inside the hall, inside the ring. And I will show you one experiment that I am part of. So our experiment is called the other to the cast collaboration. And as you heard of, there's a huge interest to look at antimatter to figure out why the world is made of matter and we don't see antimatter. Well, there should be the same amount. And what we like to do is we like to create anti hydrogen, which is the simplest and easiest antimatter atom, and look at its structure and see if there, if we could find any differences from the structure of hydrogen. And the reason why we work with Antihydrogen is first, it's the easiest atom to create. You only need one antiproton, one positron. And also the counterpart, hydrogen, it's very well studied and very well understood. So in that operation, we only have to look at antihydrogen. So the goal of our experiment is to create antihydrogen atoms and send them out in the beam to a spectroscopy apparatus where we can look in detail at the structure of the antihydrogen atoms. And the main parts, which I'm going to show here right now, we're going to have a short walk in the area here, is the part where we get the antiprotons from Elena, at positrons from a sodium source, and then create antihydrogen atoms. So now let's take a walk inside the area, and I will bring you to the end of the beam line from Elena, which supplies us with anti protons. So, here now you can see a beam line that comes on from the back and is basically ending here. This is one of the beam lines which are coming from Elena, and they are the anti protons which have been slowed down to 1% of speed of light are brought in, in our area. And now what we want to do is take this antiprotons, they are so very fast, bring them down to rest in a trap, and all we need is them to add polytrons. So the first step, what we have to do is 
take all the anti products that come out of the beam line and give a dedicated job where we collect them and bring them to rest and collect them so we can have a huge bunch of around several million anti products. So, of course, we have to make sure that the anti products don't hit any matter or air. So, the trap will be connected to the end of this with the beam line, which will be evacuated. So, the anti products travel in vacuum all the time until they reach the trap. The trap is not put in place, it's still standing in the corner. Right now, we are setting up our experiment to be connected to the new beam line. So, we are shifting things around. So, everything is a bit of pieces, but it has the advantage that. I can guide you around easier. So what you see here is this blue octopus, this blue thick box. And inside that, there is a trap where the antiprotons can be captured and put down and collected. So the trap itself is quite small. It's an array of copper rings, which are diameter of four centimeters and uh, length of the centimeters and then we take like 10 rings of those and put them in a row and this forms the trap so i don't know what you thought in detail but one way to easily capture charged particle is you have to make sure that they don't hit any material balls so you can use the strong magnetic field which forces the charged particles in small circles and then you have them confined basically in a radial direction then you only have to make sure that they don't go away in the set axis, the main set axis. And this you do with the electrodes I mentioned, so with the, like the copper rings, which you apply at the end. So the, the end copper ring will be applied at the positive potential which repels the other products. And once they're inside the string construction, they're then fully confined. So this ring construction sits inside this blue magnet. The blue part, the biggest part, makes up the magnet which can be as strong as five that long. So this is like this blue tank, you see. And inside that, we have a vacuum tube, and inside that sits our trap. So the antiprotons will go from the inner ring inside this trap, and will be accumulated and stored there. And then we have antiprotons at rest, which you can later use to make antihydrogen. So now the next step, what we need are positrons. So I will go back to the other side, to show you where we get our positrons from. Positrons are relatively easy to get. There are certain radioactive materials, for example, sodium and the that spit out positrons while this material decays. So it's very convenient. And these positrons are not so fast, so we can easily capture them. And inside this container, we have a small source of uh, sodium 32, and this is the material which you can readily buy from a company which produces them exclusively really for businesses to need positrons. So this is a small tablet with a thickness of a um, fraction of a millimeter, three millimeter diameter, which sits inside this housing, and this emits radiation, X-ray, and positrons. This can be uh, uh, dangerous, so we have to make sure that here they are shielded. So this small tablet is sitting inside a housing of labs. So where I'm standing right now, we don't have any radiation. So this tablet is sitting inside the housing in a vacuum chamber and spits out electrons, positrons, which then are guided towards a trap. So which you can see here, and this trap. Works on the same principle. We have a strong magnet which confines the charge positron radially, and also an array of electrodes which make sure that the positrons are also confined in that direction. And this trap sits there and receives the positron spit out from the sodium 22 and also are converted there until they have like several, like up to 10 million positrons. So now this is the second trap where we have all positrons. So we have, so to speak, one trap for the antiprotons and one trap for the positrons. And now we want to create antihydrogen, which means we have to bring the positrons and the antiprotons together. And for this, we have a dedicated mixing trap, which you see here. This is the same again. It's a strong magnet, now here in this violet color. And inside the strong magnet, there's another array of electrodes. So 
Unfortunately, I don't have electrodes lying around here, so I could show you, but again, the strap itself is relatively small. So the diameter is like 3 centimeters, 4 centimeters. The length is around 30 centimeters. It's a very compact strap. The big size, what you see, is due to the strong neck. So this is the mixing strap. There you put in the antiprotons, which we accumulated uh, before in the blue strap, and the polytrons coming from the sodium 22 source. So here again, you see the trap acclimating the polytrons. They are then sent out via a dedicated beam line. Oh, this is why I like tubes, which I vacated, so the polytrons don't hit any matter, because also then they will annihilate. And they go around and they'll be sent into this mixing trap. Then the next step is we take the antiprotons from the trap which is now standing at the wall. And then the antiprotons will be sent also directly by evacuated tubes into the mixing trap and then draw together. And then hopefully the antiprotons, the polytrons will get together and form antihydrogen. The problem is in the fine details, usually those particles don't behave as well as we like. So it's not so easy to bring them together. So this is some kind of fiddling and fiddling to make this sure that we have enough antihydrogen. But the idea is once this works well, Antihydrogen is formed in the trap, and as antihydrogen is neutral, it is not trapped anymore and can leave. And the trap is designed such that the antihydrogen atoms will preferably leave through the exit of the trap. And then at the free place, you will install an apparatus where you can look at the structure of antihydrogen atoms. And currently, our status is. We have everything in bits and pieces, so we have to put all the experiments together so the traps is well aligned to the Lena beam line. We can receive antiprotons, and then we have to connect the rest of the part together. And this year, in August, September, if everything works well, we will start on collecting antiprotons and forming antihydrogen. Could I ask a question, please? Yeah, sure. Uh, you've been talking about measuring the structure of antihydrogen and comparing it with the structure of hydrogen. What do you mean by structure? Well, what I mean is, for example, um, how strong a positron is bound to the antiproton when compared to an, to an hydrogen atom looking at how strong an electron is uh, bound to the proton. So how we do this is, you know that uh, in an atom, for example, in hydrogen atom, the electron can jump from different bound levels inside the atoms. And when it goes back to a lower state, it emits light. So these jumps are basically um, connected to either absorbing light or emitting light. So the light or the energy of the light tells us about this structure, internal structure. So what we do in detail is we look what kind of light or energy do you need to bring the polytron between two defined levels inside the antihydrogen antihydrogen atom? And then later we will compare this energy to measurements already done in hydrogen atoms. So the obvious next question is: how long have you been running and have you found any difference? Well, we have been running this experiment. For quite a long time. I mean, this experiment is for over 10 years. So far, we are in the state that we can create antihydrogen atoms. Now we are working on increasing the number of item, antihydrogen atoms so we can do the measurement. So we have not done the actual measurement yet. So we are still working towards the goal, but we hope to do this next year or year after. So far, so if you look at other experiments, um, yeah. who did similar measurements, who also looked at the structure of antihydrogen, they have not found any difference yet. Mm -hmm. Which means the structure of antihydrogen and hydrogen look so far what we have seen the same. Is this a disappointment or is it a... Uh... Yeah, it's kind of a disappointment. It would have been nice to have found this, of course, a difference. But yeah, it's kind of expected. Mm -hmm. 
I understand that um, there's one experiment that you haven't talked about, which is at the other side of the ring. Um, they are trying to drop anti-hydrogen and measure its rate of fall under gravity. Is that right? Yes. This is the deeper experiment that we just walked around. Yeah, they will set up in chat where they also create anti-hydrogen atoms and then they have a special technique where they can prepare an other hydrogen atoms like a certain height at rest and just let it drop and just see like how quickly it falls down. What did what do they expect? I mean, do they expect to find that Mr. Newton cares? about charge or he doesn't care about charge? Well, so far I would say the physicists, at least in that group, think yeah, it all behaves the same. But there might be some differences, which is that maybe antimatter falls a little bit faster or a little bit slower than normal matter, so there is some difference in the rotational mass. I mean, at By least the way, it has to be tested. Yeah. By the way, there is a uh, sort of a complication there, isn't there? Because if they take anti-hydrogen and drop it, it's actually being influenced by a matter Earth. So you have antimatter yeah. being influenced by matter. Could this be exactly. a source of yeah. difference between... Uh... Sure. I mean, ideally, if you really want to look at the symmetry... Yeah, ideally you would do the experiment on an anti earth that means of anti on an anti earth. Unfortunately, we don't have an anti earth available, so we have to live with the earth and just do anti matter acceleration towards metal. Somebody told me that um, the, the forerunner of this type of experiment is actually uh, measuring the mass of the anti proton compared to the proton. And I think, yes. I yes. think that, um, I don't know, it's a long time ago now, but um, when I'm talking to school students about this, I usually say, I think they've measured that the mass of the antiproton is the same as uh, the proton to an accuracy of measuring the uh, mass of the Eiffel Tower with and without a bee sitting on it. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. So, so you put a bee, you put a bee on the Eiffel Tower, you measure its mass, you take the bee off, you measure its mass, and they're the same to within that accuracy. This is this is unbelievable. I you don't can know measure it so numbers. yeah. But yeah, around this kind of position that yeah, you can think of. So I, I'll ask another couple of questions because uh, I, I'm, I think that maybe some people have read the famous book of, um, of Dan Brown in which he said you could steal enough antimatter from the uh, CERN antimatter factory, which is where you are right now, and you could use it to blow up the Vatican. Is that, is that correct? Can you make enough? I mean, you wouldn't want to do this, and we certainly wouldn't want to do it at CERN. We don't do that sort of thing. But if somebody did come, could they, could they find enough antimatter to blow up the Vatican? No. So we are working on traps which can move antimatter around, because antimatter is very interesting for a lot of research projects. So indeed, there are plans to build movable traps. But the amount of particles you can trap in is so little that it is not even enough to warm a cup of coffee by one degree Fahrenheit. So okay. yes, you can you could go here and steal a and antimatter, but there's not much you can do. Yeah. And the other thing on that line is that uh, some people hope or hoped that maybe you'd be able to make enough antimatter to send the Starship Enterprise to the far side of the universe at warp factor 10. But yeah, I guess you can't... Yeah, the same problem. Yeah, no, yeah. It's the same problem. Yeah, same problem. And also, creating uh, individual single 
until short term. I mean, in total, if you do the math, but so much energy, I don't have the right number in my head. But I mean, running this facility costs so much energy. It's not very efficient to store energy currently in Africa. Well, maybe any any uh, any question any questions from our uh, audience? Any questions? And you can unmute quickly, class, because uh, he, he keeps the meeting for us for a half an hour. So uh, if you have three questions, uh, please come come forward and ask him now. If not, we will, I mean, maybe we can fully well, walk away. One, okay. one, yeah. Mickey, one, one, sub, one obvious question is, just to get to be sure, um, can you stand where you're standing now when the experiment is running? When the experiment is on? No, so we are not allowed to be inside this area once the experiment is on. The reason is when meta and antimatter uh, come together and are hidden there. They emit a lot of radioactive radiation, a uh, bit charged particles, so which can cause our body. So basically, that's uh, radioactive radiation which can be harmful. In, uh, in just to stay safe, we have safety rules to stay away from areas where this kind of radiation can occur. And this mm -hmm. area, our experiment, is defined as such a zone where annihilation can occur because we receive all the antibodies and in the end they will annihilate somewhere. Which means, yeah, you could stay, technically you can stay here and you wouldn't feel much and it shouldn't do much harm in our world, but the safety laws demand that this is an area where potential radiation can occur. So during experiments, you have to stay outside. So, for example, if you look up, you see like a hut there. This is outside the area where um, the particle annihilate radiation can hit. So there's an area where enough of trees shield us from the annihilation point. So we can stay there, but ideally we should stay even outside the hall. So distance, distance and direction play the role. Yes. Um, and so especially when, when the shielding, you can see also our area is surrounded by concrete blocks which shields all radiation which might occur. So one last question from me. Please, our, our guests, please um, think about, ask questions. We've had a couple of interesting or announcements recently from CERN about uh, the LHCB experiment about G minus two experiment, which is actually a Fermilab experiment now. Um, should we watch this space, the antimatter factory in the near future? Is there, is there anticipation of something being discovered here? Well, for sure you should watch. I mean, whether <laughs> we discover something unexpected, well, people would say, frankly, it's slightly unlikely. But still, it's like very amazing physics, not only like by all the techniques which are developed and think of all the traps and techniques to trap antimatter and even transport like particles around. Also, all the other experiments like GIVA or Alpha or BASE, they all develop amazing techniques, which are especially, especially of interest for students who like to go into physics. And now all world for new physics, well, you never know what we might discover here. So, of course, you should keep us on, our, on your watch list. Well, it's I, certainly I, an ama amazing place. And uh, thank you. Thank you very much for showing us around. I've never been where you showed us today. I've been up on the top. I've been outside it. But I've never been inside the antimatter ring. So it's really cool. Uh, uh, Mick. There's one thing, uh, because question? I just received a question I've seen here. Uh, uh, did you, did, uh, that, to the architect, it was a question what I, what I uh, recognize. Uh, do, we, do you visualize antimatter? Actually, it came in my mind. Your background photo is uh, actually exactly um, linked to antimatter because 
if talk, you will see the uh, CMS, the picture of the CMS experiment at the background of me. And uh, there is one of my artworks where I broke the uh, circular symmetry in different ways. And then I took out uh, various LL elements and inverted the color. The, uh, the color is a symbol of antimatter. Anti anti Maybe make uh, say some words that you see you in, in the focus uh, with with the background. Yeah, <clears throat> well, I don't know what I'm supposed to say. You've said it all. I mean, this you may not have recognized the uh, the background photograph that I have, but as Michael says, it's actually the CMS. It's an ad adaptation and an interpretation of the CMS experiment, the big 15 meters diameter, uh, 20 meters long experiment that we visited some weeks ago. So this is a particle physics experiment. And we've been looking at particle physics experiments in the antimatter factory, which are just a little bit tinier than that. But we have seen today um, the, um, we saw Eleanor, which is actually very, very similar to the LHC itself. The LHC itself is 27 kilometers in circumference. Eleanor, you saw how big L uh, it is. It has all it has all the same elements as the LHC. Okay, uh, this is this is particle physics on a completely different scale to the particle physics of the LHC but is no less interesting. And that's actually why I asked the question, um, are they anticipating, are they excited? Well, I think, I think there the answer was very uh, uh, modest, actually. I think it was a modest answer that um, if these guys find something in here, at the, this, in this hall, it will be an extremely important uh, have an extremely important impact. So um, we wish them good luck and let's see what comes out of it. Anybody else want to say anything? So, don't be put don't be put off by you don't have to ask scientific questions. you can ask whatever questions you like, okay it's uh, um, <clears throat> Well, one thing I'm thinking about and listening to this is the, you know, in some ways there's, <laughs> some ways we're very different, in some ways we're very similar, but the, the practice of, of going in and doing the work day in and day out and not always having um, the discovery, right? Having things that, that fail and what comes of that. And in science, I guess there's a lot of technical papers that come out of that, like she was talking about sort of the experimentation and the techniques and certain things that come from that. And there's a similarity in terms of when we go into the studio and work and fail. Um, but I think that often in science, yours is much longer a run, you know, like your, your experimentation can last for decades. Yeah, um, 1990, was, 1996 to 2021, yeah, exactly. Okay, so yeah. <laughs> and I always find that fascinating that the questions continue to drive in that way. And, and don't, don't forget that actually, uh, which is the important thing, which we haven't talked too much about, but the technology that they use to do these experiments is actually, a lot of it is homegrown and they have to invent that technology. Now, what happens when you invent technology? Well, you can do your experiment and et cetera. But that technology then becomes available in other applications. And the stuff that you see in the hall at the AD, the stuff that you see underground at the LHC, you actually can now find outside being used in everyday world. We talked about the World Wide Web on the way here. That's just one example. Um, the, another whole domain May which I actually link, which links to the AD is that is medical applications. You may have heard that we, yeah. Uh, may I just interrupt you for a short moment because uh, this guy next to me, Volker, needs to go back to his work. Okay. <laughs> but thank him thank you very much. 
much. Yeah. Thank you very much for joining me. I hope you could get some insight in the work we did here. And maybe you have a chance to come here. And yes. um, yeah, I would be very interested to see if you have some art at here. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay, great. So, Thanks yeah, a lot. Yeah, bye. Cheers. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so what I was just trying to say there was that um, antimatter itself uh, is, is possible to, you may have heard that we, that today um, you can have hadron therapy. That means you can, instead of using photons to kill tumors, cancers, you can actually use protons to do that. And there are advantages of doing that. Beyond that, there have been experiments done in the AD area where we are today, where we've taken you today, asking the question, is it actually more effective, even more effective to use antimatter to zap cancer, okay? And I think what they found was yes, but the problem there is, uh, you need a lot of investment and a lot of equipment to produce an anti-matter uh, beam. And uh, they're not there yet, but who knows? They may be there at one point. Any other remarks or questions from, from today? We would definitely like your feedback, please. You don't have to give it to us, you can give it to Stephanie. And uh, doing something like this, as you can see, is not, it's not completely trivial. Riding a unicycle around CERN in the rain and stumbling around experimental areas and et cetera in noisy environments. So I could probably make a list of things that maybe we could do better at. But if you want to, if you want to give us some feedback, um, we, we, we'd really like to hear it, okay? We are here to help you, okay? And uh, if, we, if you can help us to improve our uh, mission, which is to help you, then we're very happy, okay? So please do it. <laughs> this has been a real treat to see, and I so appreciate the time and effort that went into this tour. I have lots of notes. Now, unfortunately, I have a confession to make. When the video, when, when uh, in really at the beginning, the Zoom went down, I was uh, so interested in getting it back up again that I didn't press the record button. So, unfortunately... I did, 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 So, you did. So, we do have... We do have yes. a, a re we do have a recording. That's cool. Okay. Yeah. What's Hello. the next bike? What's the next bike tour, Michael? What do you Michael. What are you thinking? Where are you thinking of going next? I think the next. Oh, we'll see. This is a surprise. We'll find out uh, which <laughs> which. Yeah. <laughs> Which uh, who are, who is available? Because uh, you requested you requested to have uh, to meet other people. So I will see who is who is available and who we may bump into. Okay. So the next next bike okay. tour will be a surprise. Wonderful. That was so, so good. Well, I am, and I'm sure everyone is about the generosity of. The people, you, Michael and Mike, and also the people that are talking no, to us and giving us their time. And they are really generous. I am I'm really taken by that. It's very kind. Okay. Well, thanks for that. And we hope we can uh, we come back with another interesting Michael Hawk bike tour. And we hope that it's not <laughs> raining next yes. time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and okay. In the meantime a little yeah. bit more uh, the unit tackle because I didn't do a lot of Nick for yeah. putting us in as well. Okay. All right. <laughs> and thanks. Okay. Thanks to Thank you so much. Okay. Yes.